Hapane, um, Guahusine Chloris, Ginen Wohan, Ginen Isas Marioras, Ginen Lapos Dengani, Finet Anam Bai Pinta Onora, and Tatatano. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Monica Flores. I, please call me Nake. I'm from the island of Guam or Guahan, which is in the Marianas Islands Archipelago, known as Lagos Dengani in our native language. And before I start, I really want to take a moment. You know, we are two indigenous women. A lot of folks don't recognize or realize that Okinawa has an indigenous people and indig is indigenous land that's occupied by Japan. And Guahan also is an indigenous place in the Marianas Archipelago, that's the homeland of our ancestors that's occupied by the United States. And um, as indigenous people, we come here with a tremendous amount of humility, respect, and um, care for the First Nations people here. And so before I go further, I'd like to take a second to acknowledge the people of this land, the people of this place, the Tatatana. That's what we say in our, in our language, Tatatana's people of the land. We just had a super typhoon at home in May. Um, it devastated our island. Uh, our island was without, many people were without power for a month. Uh, a lot of, it really put our water um, system, uh, really heavy challenges on our water system. We didn't have safe, clean drinking water for the island for several weeks. And it's be a lot of this is because of the damage that's occurred or the construction of the bases. It's compounding at home, you know, to think that we, here we are in these islands, which are ground zero for the climate catastrophe. This is not something in the future, this is something that's happening now. These storms are made much more violent and destructive because of the climate crisis. And the United States military is the world's worst polluter. They're responsible for a great deal of emissions that's exacerbating the climate crisis. And so to know that that's happening, to be at this site of a violent storm, but also to see the violence happening on the land to our water and our people at the same time, it's truly a, a massive issue. And um, as we were recovering from the typhoon, we have also seen that the military has taken this opportunity to send a message that promotes hyper-militarization, hyper-federalization of our land. They are part of the recovery efforts. We have special ops forces, for instance, going out into our villages, helping people repair their roofs. And this is extremely problemat problematic. Um, it's reinforcing systems of dependency and, and, uh, and silencing truly the indigenous response. Our folks have, we, our people have been resilient to typhoons for thousands of years. However, these are very different kinds of storms we're talking about today, and we should not be made to continue to suffer the impacts of these storms because of because of the climate crisis. As, you know, we were trying to recover from the storm. We also saw that the, the building of the base didn't slow down. In fact, it was really difficult for us to get any trucks to help haul away debris um, because all of the trucks and heavy machinery are going to the base. We actually tried to rent several dumpsters and trucks and heavy machinery to help clean our island. Several friends of mine, several organizations that we support who were in the immediate typhoon response couldn't rent anything because it was all going, it's all being diverted to the base. At the same time, we had three consecutive um, military, massive military exercises. We had Pacific Vanguard, Pacific Griffin, and Exercise Mobility Guardian, really one after the other, which is all leading up to Talisman Saber that's happening now. And as she was talking about the helicopter crashes, you know, there was a helicopter crash that just happened here. And so we're grieving the loss, of course, of four lives, four Australian lives. Um, somebody yesterday said these men were lied to. These people were lied to, and they believed that they were doing something for justice in their lives. They've ended up losing their lives. That, of course, with the contamination that comes with the crash of that kind of helicopter. Whenever a helicopter crashes in Okinawa, there's a lot of <coughs> contamination that comes with it, especially with the ospreys that have radioactive material on them, and they leach into the ground, into the ocean. Um, we have a serious issue of PFAS contamination as well. She mentioned PFAS is a serious issue in Okinawa. Uh, Shinako did, and um, PFAS we're finding at home, all of the water wells that the Navy has returned to our public water system have increasing levels of PFAS and PFAS. Um, Agent Orange, Shinako also talked about, uh, on our way here, we were talking about how for many decades now, since the Vietnam War, the Depart US Department of Defense denied the use of Agent Orange in Wuhan 
um, saying that they never sprayed Agent Orange, even though there were Vietnam veterans testifying and dying and their children and grandchildren also impacted by that contamination, um, saying that they were in Wuhan spraying Agent Orange. They're, they're, they're gone now. And now finally, just within like the last year, about the Department of Defense finally declassified that information and has admitted they've also sprayed Agent Orange in our island. We're in the fallout area for the nuclear testing of the Marshall Islands. And so um, there's, there's a good number of people now who have rare illnesses associated with that nuclear testing, directly as an impact of that nuclear testing in the Marianas, I'm sorry, in, in the Marshall Islands. is the horrible cost to, to our people. Instead of using all this money for warfare, this money could go toward housing, toward education, toward healthcare, toward, a, toward food security and water security, genuine security issues. Instead, all of this money, trillions of dollars in the United States, is being, is being uh, used to cause more more harm to the environment, and basically guaranteeing the total destruction of many endangered species, guaranteeing the contamination of our water sources, guaranteeing the desecration of our sacred sites, our ancestral burials, and, and you know keeping us as colonized people under colonial violence, under military violence. And of course, this is all connected to capitalism. A lot of people are getting very wealthy, um, making a lot of money off of these arms, these war arms, and um, capitalism supports white supremacy. So these are all connected issues that we really have to challenge ourselves to think about the ways we can combat uh, these, the economic colonialism, the educational colonialism, colonial media. We have to really think about ways to break down this massive massive uh, leviathan, right? This monster of a problem that is the US uh, military industrial complex. And what's also happening is something called, we talk about called borderlands invisibility, where these sovereign nations now, the borders are sort of made invisible because it's becoming just a, a world, a, a, an ocean that is a colony of the United States since it's being occupied by US military. We're talking about the Philippines. They have four bases now being prepared there. They might take back Subic Bay, which is a massive military installation. The ongoing expansion in Okinawa, Japan, in the Northern Marianas, the islands north of Wuhan, they are building a divert airstrip, which they're trying to make it sound like it's a temporary base, but what, what it is is it's occupying more indigenous land. And the purpose for constructing that airfield is because we are going to, Wuhan is known for its over-reliance that the United States military over relies and has invested millions and millions of dollars in military infrastructure, that we will, we will be one of the first sites attacked should the United States enter into conflict in the region with China or North Korea. Wuhan, Okinawa, and the Philippines are being set up to be first strike communities. And that's actually part of the rationale for what's happening here with Talisman Saber and AUKUS. And the demand to, to spend all of this Australian money for these nuclear-powered submarines because that's an anticipation of our annihilation. When, when the United States military outposts are destroyed in our islands, then Australia will come to the rescue of the United States. This is all horrific, isn't it? And it feels quite overwhelming and quite hopeless, but as Shinako said, it really, we really have to draw strength in our solidarity and as Pacific peoples demand not just peace for our ocean, for our Pacific, but for the world. Australia has this tremendous opportunity to be a voice for the global community to say we refuse to be a part of war. We want to be a country for peace. A lot of you don't know that Guam is a, is a colony of the United States. Um, after the Spanish-American War, we became a colony of the United States and we are called a territory. And the territorial clause in the Constitution of the United States defines us, people and land, as property. We do not vote for the President of the United States. We do not have a voting representative in Congress. And the decision to move the Marines from Okinawa to Guam was a completely unilateral decision, done without the input or consent of the people of Guam. Um, and again, that's also a burden on the government of Japan, who has to spend billions of dollars as well to build the military infrastructure in Guam for the relocation of the, of the Marines from Okinawa to Guam. It's a similar situation that's happening here, where your government is made to foot the bill for United States Empire 
It's just got to stop. It has to stop. We have three bases. We have a, an Air Force base and a Navy base. The Air Force base is at the northern end of Guam and the, and the Navy base is at the southern end of Guam. And now we have the construction of a new Marine base and a new live fire training arena complex. The military occupies 30% of our small island. Um, they already withdraw millions of gallons of water a day from our aquifer. They will exploit an additional million gallons of water a day for this new marine base. Um, at the firing range, they, were, they will fire seven million rounds of ammunition a year. This is horrible because it takes place over our sole source aquifer, which provides our island 85 to 95% of our fresh drinking water. And as we saw with the typhoon, the clearing of that land for the base and the live fire training range complex made our aquifer so vulnerable to, to, to protect and to recharge. Um, we said we had a water crisis after the typhoon. And we're also seeing a housing crisis. Um, because all of the construction is being diverted to the, to the new marine base, we don't have any resources to construct new homes and, and apartments outside of the base. But in addition to that, there's something called an overseas housing allowance, which has driven up property and rental costs exponentially um, and has forced a lot of people to relocate away from home. Um, we, we're basically being priced out of our own homes and we, I, may, we, I may not even be able to ever afford a home in, you know, in Guahan. In addition to all of this, our island is now about to, um, uh, we're starting the scoping meetings for the missile defense system. By, they've identified 20 potential sites around the island, and as, we t as I talked about earlier, a lot of land was stolen by eminent domain after World War II. My family lost a lot of land. My great-grandfather lost a huge ranch lands. Um, they were stolen by the Air Force, are occupied by the Air Force today. And we actually get to drive through that land to access whatever land we have left on the inside, which is a very small amount. It's landlocked between two federal entities, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Air Force. And we have to ask permission to go to our ancestral land, which is an extremely dehumanizing experience. These uh, nuclear defense sites are quite uh, catastrophic because while they're being promoted as a way to defend the island, they are actually a, an opportunity for the United States to, 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 to um, project force from Guam. Uh, these are very dangerous launchers that they're putting around the island, and, um, and it's, it's, it's getting us caught up as a place for the United States to, to provoke conflict, to continue to provoke the conflict in the region um, without our consent. We, we're, we're, this time of year, July and August at home, is the time where we commemorate the violent recapture of, that American forces carried out of our islands. Um, you know, uh, Guam was attacked within just a few hours from Pearl Harbor in Hawaii by Jap the Japanese Imperial Army, and we were occupied for around three years, and then there was a horrible, violent American recapture. It's called, the one of the holidays that commemorated is called Liberation Day, but those of us in the movie call, we call it Reoccupation Day. And during the occupation, the Japanese Imperial occupation, we experienced of course, death, torture, forced enslavement, forced march, forced labor, um, sexual uh, enslavement. Uh, actually, women were brought from Okinawa, the Philippines, Korea, and as well as Chamorro women from home were forced into sexual slavery for, um, and, and, and those things didn't necessarily end when the Americans came. We were, in camp, we were put in camps, um, families were separated, and sexual violence also occurred when the Americans came to liberate us. But this time of year is very painful because we commemorate, uh, we remember our war dead, um, a lot of the tragedies that happened, a lot of the massacre sites uh, where people were murdered, groups of people were murdered, and uh, our own people. But also, we said that we honor our war survivors, and my grandparents are our war survivors, and so this is just a couple generations away from me. And as we are recovering from this typhoon, as we're remembering the war, as we're holding all of this grief and rage, the military continues to do its destruction and continues to make us a target for war. One of the, sh the I'm going to end with this, and is that we didn't we didn't find out that um, there was also a plan for nuclear microreactors for this missile defense system. Our island doesn't generate enough power for the missile defense system, and so they also want to put nuclear microreactors around the island. So this is very dangerous. They they have a lot of accidents. It's very difficult to know when these 
are malfunctioning and there are leaks because there's no smoke, there's no smell. They could be leaching contamination uh, without our knowing. But of course, if we are attacked, that guarantees, right, the leaching of this radioactive material into our soil and our, our groundwater. Um, I'm a member of Crete uh, Latexan Say Retidian. We're a we're a grassroots group. We just became a nonprofit, which has been a painful transition, <laughs> if I'm being honest. But we are involved in two lawsuits against the military, one for the firing range for the for violations of the, the Endangered Species Act, and one for their plans to do open burn and open detonation of, of World War II munitions um, on the beach, uh, very close to the land that my that was stolen from my family. Um, and uh, you know, the, all of this, you know, bringing these horrible stories, these stories of heartbreak, these stories of now several generations of this kind of colonial violence um, to you is to see how it connects to your reality here, to the things that are happening here. And um, that's why solidarity is so important, coming to each, to each other's communities, sharing our stories, but also bearing witness to the ongoing violence is so critical to our work, um, finding ways to collaborate together, to share resource, share knowledge. But also something that's really important is to also center indigenous sovereignty in the peace movement. Because there's so much internalized racism and colonization and fear, this, this media machine is very powerful. It really does, goes very far to make our people feel hopeless and powerless and, and scared. Like, oh my gosh, if the military wasn't here, who would help us in this typhoon? Or, oh man, if, if the United States wasn't here, who would help us if we have this attack? You know, it's like, no, <laughs> we have to challenge that. And so, but I think every single one of us in this room is here because of love, because we love our people, our families, and the land that we call home, and we know that we deserve better. <laughs>